Matt is here with me in Denver. He came out on a little ski trip, and I uh, snagged him for an extra day because his flight was delayed, canceled. You guys have a little snowstorm down in Texas. We're here for you guys. We get them every week here in Colorado. Uh, so, you know, wimps, but glad you're here. And this is the perfect opportunity to talk about ordinals and inscriptions and what Bitcoin block space is actually for. So welcome to the show in person. First in-person show we've done since November. So appreciate you being here. Thanks. Uh, although I don't know if I could just gloss over the the hit. You just took to all the Texans. You yeah. like snuck that in there at the beginning and then opened the show, told everyone what we were going to do. Yeah. But yeah. I guess you're letting me crash while my flight's canceled. So I'll let it slide for now. Yeah, I'm being nice. I'm being nice. Uh, that's uh, the payment for all the news roundups. Um, for those listening, Matt is a researcher at CoinShares, I almost said CoinDesk, but previously at CoinDesk, uh, but been a researcher at CoinShares for quite a while with a specific focus on Bitcoin, just did an awesome paper on tarot implementation or protocol implementation on top of Lightning Network, which has been helpful and instructive in understanding what's going on with ordinals, which itself is sort of confusing to a lot of people. They're thinking like NFTs on Bitcoin, why is that happening in the first place, let alone why should I care? But we'll hand it over to you just to begin, like, what the hell is an original? <laughs> well, first, I got to say that, like, NFTs started on Bitcoin. They've been on Bitcoin for a super long time. You can go back to, to 2011, 2012. Um, people were putting in uh, just arbitrary data through, like, a specific field in a Bitcoin transaction called op return. You could put... Um, little images in there. People were using it in uh, colored coins or counterparty. Um, and I think even a little bit Omni to uh, make some NFTs. So it all kind of started on Bitcoin, but it's kind of interesting that it's coming back. Um, and you mentioned Taro, which stands for Taproot Asset uh, Relay. Ooh, 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 paper. Taproot Forgot. Asset Representation Overlay. <laughs> so basically like you know, Taproot was activated in, in November 2021. And there's a lot of excitement f with Taproot because there's a lot of like just kind of in the most Bitcoin fashion way, a lot of incremental improvements to uh, speed and security. Um, but there was like, there's a new transaction type that came with it that kind of allowed some more um, developer capabilities and kind of an interesting side effect of that is this ordinals thing. Um, and tarot kind of as well. And so I guess maybe we should talk about what ordinals is. Yeah, let's dig into to the ordinals. Okay. The ords. So ordinals is a way to track specific Satoshis. And so uh, I guess for some of the newbies out there, right, like one um, Bitcoin is made up of 10 billion Satoshis. I think that's right to the eight decimal places. Uh, ordinals is just a way to basically take what is normally fungible, which is like one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, one sat equals one sat, um, but actually assign an, an order to it um, in a sequence. And so within uh, a specific output, within a Bitcoin output, UTXO, um, you have like sats that are ordered one, two, three, four, five, right? And there's 21 million, sat, uh, 21 million Bitcoin so there's 21, I think, quadrillion sats. Um, and so you have one to 21 quadrillion different unique little Satoshis that you can track and follow um, if you use this specific standard, which is called ordinal. Okay, so then you're using that specific track, uh, tracking way to like find Satoshis, like label them and using this ordinal method. Uh, what from there? Like how do we get the inscription part? How do we get to the JPEG part? How do we get to the part where we're like, putting lots of arbitrary, random, sometimes meaningless data on chain. Yeah, so you're tracking each individual Satoshi and the inscription part is basically just stamping it with some data. Um, so like the way that I kind of picture it in my head is like, you say I have like one cent, like I have a penny um, and I just like make a little sticky note doodle and I just like stick it to the cent. And that's basically what an inscription is. It's just in a more digital fashion and it follows this ordinal kind of standard, so you know which sat is which sat, if that makes sense. Gotcha, okay, so using like the inner workings of the Bitcoin protocol to 
put on initial data onto a Satoshi. One thing I want to like circle back to is the fact that like we can track each Satoshi ordinally, right? So that's where we're driving from like one, two, three, four, five, right? What does that do to the fungibility of each Satoshi, right? The fact that each Satoshi has some sort of label associated with it, like it has some sort of number placement within its history of being mined. Uh, that seems to break Bitcoin's fungibility or at least be something that hurts Bitcoin's fungibility because you want every single Bitcoin. I want one penny to be the same as another penny, right? When I'm going to spend it. Obviously, each penny has a different track record. They could be minted at a different location, different copper. Uh, they could be minted different years. And so there's ways of like figuring out if a penny is as fungible as another penny. But at the same time, like I understand that that penny is always going to be worth one cent. In Bitcoin parlance, like you'd think that a digital currency would have more fungibility, right? Where I wouldn't have any sort of association with it. Yeah. So I would say like fundamentally within the Bitcoin protocol in and of itself, um, Bitcoin is completely fungible, right? Uh, one sat equals one sat. It's when you kind of run this uh, supplementary protocol on top of it and you follow ordinals and you, know, you have to have a specific uh, wallet that kind of understands the standard. That's when you can kind of differentiate between the sats and you kind of know the order of things. And then you can also kind of understand the inscriptions, right? These kind of like images are like what you know, NFTs uh, yeah. are a part of each set. Yeah. Um, but like fundamentally within the Bitcoin protocol itself, right, there's nothing that's changing. This yeah. is kind of like an outside thing that people are just kind of adopting. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's kind of like a, a side quest I wanted to ask you a question about. But let's get back into like the debate. The nature of it seems to be about like storing arbitrary data on chain. And this was going back to like 2014 with the op return wars where those people like, we want to do more things. We want more functional, some functionality. Wow, functionality. There we go. Functionality within Bitcoin. So we want things like DApps. We want op return to be able to carry more data, all that good stuff. And the debate basically ended up with 80 millibytes of data on chain for op return, and then it was lowered again to like 40 millibytes or something like that. And that's sort of where we left the arbitrary data debate, and now it's opening up again, but in a different way, right? We're taproot. And SegWit and a few other things, which I'm going to let you explain this in a second because you're already smirking at me, allows you to store some amount of arbitrary data. And you've always been able to do this if you were willing to pay. But here we have some more controversy because there were some things that were discounted data that are being taken advantage of in order to mint JPEGs. Yeah, I, that was a great uh, explanation. Um, Thank you. I mean, we don't have to get like too technical in the weeds because like I don't think people really care that much about that. But you know, op return was like this arbitrary field. You could stick anything in it, right? Um, and it didn't affect kind of like the validity of a Bitcoin transaction. Um, and it actually used to in the beginning. Um, I think it was a part of the original protocol like the satoshi released reference implementation um where it, it wasn't limited by any byte size uh and i think it was in 2014 where they limited it to um i think it's 83 bytes or 80 bytes yeah um, i was data wrong earlier how much data it was yeah and so people basically saw that as an opportunity to create outside protocols um to do stuff to have some like utility um to embed within bitcoin transactions and like i think the common parlance term is like data anchoring right you have an outside protocol that has like a, a standard messaging format um they do that person that consistent format within these transactions then they have a protocol that tracks it on the chain right mm -hmm. public blockchain um and then basically you can have dApps on that you can issue assets through that that's kind of what you know, Omni counterparty, but you know, Omni was formerly MasterCoin. That was where Tether first started, right? Counterparty is like, I think commonly accepted as the first ICO. Yeah. Um, they made some like betting applications, like a lot of the things that are prevalent on kind of these other smart contract chains that really focused on uh, developer friendliness and like the things that you can do more easily having like fully expressive blockchain systems with their own programming languages 
you know, that kind of sacrificed and, and traded off some decentralization to kind of allow more customization in what you could do. A lot of the things that they made capable and are kind of known for today, like these applications and, and ICOs, kind of originated with these op return protocols back in the day. Um, and so now this, like what Ordinals is doing doesn't use op return. Um, it's kind of like a post segwit version of uh of bitcoin that uses something called the the witness field which has to do with uh signature data and and it's you know kind of gets in a little bit into the weeds there um but people are using these new taproot transactions because it made it um easier to embed some data within that field by using these taproot transactions and so that's kind of where um these like inscriptions are are going mm -hmm. um and instead of them being limited by the size of the op return field which was 80 bytes they're kind of only limited by the size of a block which is magnitudes larger right um at i believe four megabytes yeah yeah which is big which we were just before we started recording here saw on twitter that someone had minted essentially the size of an entire block in ordinal is what it looked like so which is just ridiculous large yeah and that's not that's not what a lot of people will say bitcoin's for and so that's sort of the the deep part of this debate which we'll get into in a second um i want to go back to the technical part before we jet off into that um really more key territory and just ask more about the data part so with taproot maybe we should go back to that explain a little bit about it because i bet a lot of people on this podcast are not familiar with that um that launched and or was went live in November 2021. I don't know much about Tapper, to be honest, did not pay attention much to that. And a lot of Bitcoiners honestly did not pay a lot of attention to it. In some ways, it's a little conjecture, but in some ways is why we have this thing going on right now, right? Like a lot of people didn't know uh, about Taproot. There's a lot of developers who wanted this to go live and there's always unintended consequences when you add a new functionality to Bitcoin or you add something onto the chain. And so there's been some interesting conversations on Twitter. I've seen stuff from like Andrew Palestra and others talking about how like maybe this was unexpected, but it was always possible with how Bitcoin works. And if you didn't have Taproot, like you wouldn't be able to do certain things. And so maybe there is a debate there. But that all being said, let's go back to to Taproot a little bit and like explain more in depth about like this singular part with like the witness and pruning and all that. Yeah. So and like bear with me here. Um, that's what we're the, the technical details are, are a little sticky, uh, and I'll do my best. Um, but basically the witness field actually came about, um, and segwit, which happened seg segregated witness, right? Which came about in 2017. Um, but taproot really was just a way to, um, make more complex types of transactions cheaper you know, ordinals and inscriptions are kind of using the, the and tarot as well, the kind of complex um, abilities that are a part of taproot transactions to do this. Um, so, like, I guess we could talk about pay-to-taproot transaction types. Um, it's kind of a transaction type that encompasses, like, all the previous ones. So, you know, at the beginning, it was kind of just pay-to-public key, right? Um, and then kind of a couple years later, you got a little bit more functionality with pay to script hash. And that's kind of what people can consider more like smart contract type of transactions. Um, commonly used for things like multi-sig today where you have a couple different um, people that authorize a spend rather than just one, mm -hmm. right? Or you at least have the capability to do that where you embed some sort of conditions um, and kind of restrictions to a transaction, right? And Taproot kind of encompasses those transaction types into one, where you can just kind of do a normal public key spend, or um, you could do a little bit more complicated one, uh, which is called a script path spend. Um, and these uh, ordinal type of transactions use that script path spend. And there kind of hasn't been a lot of adoption of Taproot transactions just quite yet. And I think it's because you know, generally there's not a huge incentive unless there are those applications and developments um, put forward uh, where you do more sort of complicated things and it's cheaper to do so. 
so I think like to, in my mind, when Terra was first released, I was like, oh, this is something that um, could sort of increase taproot usage. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is like typical for Bitcoin uh, soft forks that get activated, right? Developers have to test it out um, and kind of build it into uh, wallets that kind of support these new transaction types. Um, and then, you know, people can sort of use them and experiment with them a little bit more freely. Um, but I mean, the interesting thing with ordinals is it's kind of like pushing the agenda. Yeah. Um, since the start of January, there's been double the amount of taproot outputs created than there were previously. I mean, this is something that was activated in November, 2021. So there's certainly, uh, an appetite for it, which is interesting, even though it's controversial. Yeah, it is definitely controversial. Let's get into that in one more second. Uh, one thing I want to pull on is just about the data part right now. So I think the number I saw yesterday, this is uh, what they, and it's, it's like Tuesday, it's Wednesday, February 1st. Uh, I saw this, I think yesterday, Tuesday, January 31st, was that there's only like 166 inscriptions so far or something like that. And so it's like not a significant, significant amount of data. That being said, a lot of people are still frustrated about it. What do you take on like the data part of this? Is it like, is it bad for the network? Is it too much data? Or do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think like Bitcoin is an open protocol and as long as people are paying market rates for transaction fees, they're being accepted by miners. Yeah. Sorry. Like that's what Bitcoin is. Um, it's open. No one can tell you what to do. It's It cannot be gate kept, right? Like that is a core tenant of Bitcoin. Yeah. Is that there's censorship resistance. Um, I mean, of course, long term, do we want... Uh, the chain to be do we want it to be as easy as possible for people to become a full node within the network yeah yes we want that to be as low cost as possible that supports decentralization that is central to like the long-term viability of bitcoin i think that's kind of commonly agreed upon within the bitcoin ecosystem that being said you know when i was doing a tarot report i was researching a lot of the op return type of transactions and I mean, if you look at the transactions on the whole, there's, I think there's around like 16 gigabytes. This is about, I think two months ago, I went and kind of scraped all those transactions. But, you know, of the, the arbitrary messages that were attached in the chain, this is before they had that little limit to that data field and afterwards, there's only about two, or is it just that message field where they're embedding it in there? And I mean, you know, the chain right now is like a little over, I guess, 500 gigabytes. Ellen, percentage wise, that's not huge. That's yeah. not major. Um, I think something that was key to uh, the op return transactions was that they were prunable. Those uh, outputs were prunable from the UTXO set. Yeah. Meaning, like the memory cost, uh, the RAM, right, that you're running on your Bitcoin core node, didn't need to think about those type of transactions. You didn't need to follow yeah. all those op return transactions. Well, the interesting thing that you and I were talking about earlier today is like you can prune your Bitcoin node and take away this data for ordinals and you're still syncing to the tip of the chain. You still have the history, you still verify transactions, but you do lose some functionality. And so there's been some people been like, hey, Bitcoin Max wants to hate the ordinals. That's fine. You can hate it. Just prune your node. Your node. It's still a full node. But as you were telling me earlier today, that's not completely true because you do lose some functionality when you start pruning things. Yeah, so um, if you basically, like, if you if you prune part of every block, uh, if there's a new member that wants to come onto the network, they everyone has to go through the initial block download. You have to go through and get the whole chain, right? And so what do you have to do? You ask peers in the network for that data. Um, and basically, if you've pruned that away, then you can't assist in that process. There's also kind of a quirk about if you're going to try to restore, like, a wallet, um, there's something called like wallet rescan, which was something where you kind of go and trace UTXOs back in history. You follow all the specific transactions since, uh, you know, that UTXO was cr- like first created from the Coinbase and you can kind of see your balance and track it over time. Um, you do kind of lose that if you, if yeah. you prune your node. And so, you know, on the whole, what, do we want everyone in the network to be a full peer and have the full blockchain? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and I think that's maybe part of the reason why some people don't necessarily love uh, ordinals. 
And Did, people in general, right, don't yeah. want chain bloat. They don't want you want yeah. the tran- you want the it to be as easy as possible to become a peer and for the storage cost to be as low as possible. And that was sort of the interesting thing. So we definitely saw some strong tweets from Bitcoin Core or like Bitcoin devs. Um, so Adam Back tweeted about it, saying like we need to have miners probably censor these transactions. Luke Dasher went really, really far as well. Uh, I don't have the quote on me, but basically just saying that it was chain bloat, it was bad for the network. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, Andrew Palestra had some thoughts about it. Basically saying it was a, a quirk of something it built, but it was worth the trade-off and probably not dangerous enough to worth doing something technically about it. Like there wasn't an argument to change anything technically, even though he would consider it chain bloat. So I'd like to get a response from you on, on your thoughts about that, like Bitcoin core culture. And then let's, let's finish the conversation talking about like, what is the purpose of Bitcoin uh, UTXOs or for just like spending Bitcoin or is it for dApps, things like that. But thoughts on any of the prominent Bitcoiners out there and their hatred towards ordinals? I mean, I think there's kind of been that battle back to when off return was first kind of being popularized by these outside protocols and people were wanting to do more things with um block space um and i think there's kind of always going to be two sides to that argument um do we want to build new utility in and let people do whatever they want or you know we should do the most how do i say it so most bitcoiny thing <laughs> and just have financial transactions right peer-to-peer electronic money what do we do? We just send transaction back and forth. Um, we don't need anything else. You know, go use another chain. But I mean, the beauty of Bitcoin is people can do uh, really whatever they want within the guidelines, right? And as long as miners take those transactions, there's an ep- economical fee. It'll be processed um, in due time. So the pushback on that, of course, is like, let's take it from an altcoin angle. Is Bitcoin really that what you're describing? Like a like a place where you can do whatever you want because the rules are extremely restric- restrictive, right? And so this goes back to opportunity wars. It goes back to DApps versus no DApps. It goes back to block size wars. And Bitcoin's culture has been very constrictive, uh, conservative, probably the better word. But you can't do a lot of these things. And I think that's why ordinals and the fact that people are like now minting these huge transactions on chain is getting so much pushback because Bitcoin was really just supposed to be for sending Bitcoin and not for for anything else. When I was saying you could do whatever you want within Bitcoin, I was more speaking to the censorship resistance aspect of it. Um, You know, Ordinals figured out a way to use Bitcoin script um, and put NFTs on the chain. Yeah. Right? And no one could stop them. They did it and it's currently happening. Transaction fees are going up. This is a mining pod, right? Miners are happy. Yeah. They're good. Miners are definitely going to like this. Miners got to love it. Seeing a lot of miners talking about it, talking about minting stuff. I think miners like that kind of thing as well, right? Like miners enjoy tangible things. Uh, if we like ASICs, we like power, we like facilities. We like more money per hash. Yeah, right? money per hash. So that's not surprising. Yeah. I, I do just like, and this is this is a good part. I'm seeing a lot of like altcoiners and others be like, oh, ordinals are sick. I love that Bitcoin's doing that. Bitcoin's fun again. Uh, and I agree with them. Like I would like more of that functionality in Bitcoin. That's why I've had a lot of people on this podcast who do want Bitcoin to be more open and allow more, be like a little bit more progressive. I understand both sides and I can appreciate the the limited view set, but I'm of the opinion that like at least explore more functionality for Bitcoin. So this is a pretty cool thing to watch unfold. That being said, it, it doesn't feel like the argument that ordinal enjoyers are making is necessarily correct because they're all i've seen a lot of people talk about like ordinals is an expression of the ability to do anything on bitcoin but that's not really true right like you can't do anything you want on bitcoin it's very limited compared to other chains if i go to ethereum i can open up a lot of different applications immediately like i just have to pay something to network and i'm good to go and even ethereum is constructive right like compared to other chains and you do that for a reason for security uh, mostly, and then some other use cases, right? So, like, any responses to that? I don't necessarily get a question, but just want to get your thoughts on it. Might make some people mad, but, I mean, Solana, Ethereum, pretty much ghost towns before DeFi and NFTs, and I think Ordinals is making NFTs. There's at least a burst of excitement about it. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't necessarily like here's, you know, it might make some other people upset on this one too, on the Bitcoin side. I don't necessarily think that it's super sustainable just because the fee market right now on Bitcoin is super low. Blocks aren't full, right? Um, using the witness field, people get a discount basically on making these types of transactions. It's super cheap. It's cheaper than on Ethereum Yeah. Um, currently to mint one of these NFTs. Um, I also like will say that, you know, ordinals, I don't think we necessarily know what all yet is capable of this. Yeah. NFTs are super easy first application because that's inherent in what ordinals are doing. Yeah. They are labeling each Satoshi to where in and of themselves you can recognize them and differentiate between them. That's making them non fungible. Yeah. Um, what people are doing with inscriptions is just taking those those uh, each of those units and just punching it with some data. Yeah. And like, you know, um, I've seen Bitcoin punks, right? Which is like a common mm -hmm. NFT collection of Ethereum. Bitcoin Bitcoin rocks. Rocks. <laughs> and I mean, like, they're getting bit up. Um, I hopped in the Ordinals Discord just to see, which by the way, there's like a thousand people in there and the yeah. messages are going off. Um, there's definitely excitement there. But um, one of those NFTs is going for like 0.4 Bitcoin. Like, yeah, that's crazy. You know, like $10,000. Um, in this which, economy, yeah. Yeah, it, it, right? That's a lot of coin, yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I'm interested to see where this goes. Um, Jeremy Rubin made an interesting comment. Yeah, I saw that. I wanted to bring that up. Glad you are. Go ahead. Yeah, so first, like, Jeremy Rubin made the, the CTV proposal about, like, Bitcoin Covenants a while back. He's, like, been a long-time contributor to um, Bitcoin Core. And he was basically saying that we could use an inscription to um, put like the Bitcoin core code base, uh, just like in the blockchain. And someone could, could scrape that in case there was any GitHub issues. Um, there's obviously some factors of trust in there, but like that's a use case that's not necessarily an NFT. Yeah. It's using it as a data anchor in kind of another way, which you probably wouldn't be able to do in an 80 byte field like Opreturn. Um, so it's interesting. I think like, ideas are happening right and it's like in a kind of apathetic period of the bitcoin cycles this is fun to me yeah. to to follow along and see what kind of ideas people have and i mean the controversy just like makes it more exciting too the pot's being stirred uh and in kind of like an unstructured community where there's no leader like this is what it's all about people get to debate um and decide how they want to use things and if they want to use things and if it's right for bitcoin if it's wrong for bitcoin I mean, this is part of the reason why we're in the space, right? No, I love it. Uh, I think it's super fun. Like, I, that's why, I like, on this podcast, having those people who kind of go against the grain a little bit. Because uh, I think that Bitcoin Core and Bix Bitcoin Maximalist position is pretty well known at this point. Like, it, it's understood. So why not have some other people out there? What are some other use cases for ordinals that you can think of right now that might be out there? You just mentioned the one you can store like, data on chain. People put the white paper on chain like a billion times. Those are kind of just like... Nice mile markers, like worst case scenarios, get the code base. Is there anything for like scaling solutions that you could see like being built in something like this or it's like just not really there? You'd need something completely different. I don't know because you're, you're confined by chain space. Um, I mean, people could start, uh, I guess, sort of like other and like, you know, this is where the technical details of ordinals kind of, uh, misses me and kind of like my interpretation here mm -hmm. but you know if you can kind of post arbitrary data to it people can do you know feasibly similar things to what counterparty used to do have another structured way to kind of read data yeah. um, and have some sort of outside protocol that does x utility yeah. right I think like for the NFT like for the NFT part of this to be sustainable um I think you'd need like a solid marketplace. Like if you look at the Solana and Ethereum NFT communities, right? You had like OpenSea pop up and that like really skyrocketed the attention on NFTs. On Solana, I was like, I think it's Magic Eden. I mean, yeah, there's a bunch of those. But I mean, the thing about NFTs is like they're all about community, right? So you need to, I don't know, in a funny way, I think what the kind of Bitcoin maximalists that don't want this, like that are very anti-chain bloat and that this is a super bad thing. What I don't think they understand is I think they're actually kind of attracting a lot of the trolls 
that are just like kind of bored in the crypto space and it's kind of free marketing for them and fuel like a, a rally cry against the maximalist to attract people from an nft communities to like hop on bitcoin and do this stuff yeah um so yeah i think like a community would really need to like seed around this i mean a thousand people in a discord that's definitely a start and the first inscription i think was mid-december yeah so pretty short order um, but I think definitely a marketplace need to pop up and then, you know, NFT people, they literally market like the collections, like compete on who has the best vibes. Yeah. Like it's hilarious. <laughs> I am looking forward to that. Um, maybe there's some other stuff you mentioned like counterparty and, you know, like Omni and all that kind of stuff was built on top of, on top of opportunity. Maybe there's something like that. Um, I know you're a big fan of tarot and you want to see like stable coins come lighting that way. So. Maybe there's stuff in the works. I hope this is the beginning of it. We'll leave the conversation there. Uh, thanks for joining for an in-person podcast. Hopefully you can catch your flight tomorrow. Thank you, Will. <laughs> <laughs>